I've attended this group once before, and it was um, the ENCODE people who were trying to explain how a vast majority of the genes are actually doing something, and I thought it was a really interesting talk, but that wasn't enough experience, so I had no idea what level you guys are at. The first speaker has scared me a little. I may be a little too basic. But um, the other thing is, I have a really odd workflow. The reason I have so many different things in my group is because I don't have anything. I'm a mathematician. I know a lot of math. And so my workflow is somebody walks in the door with a problem they're having trouble solving, and they have to talk at me until I understand their problem, and then I try to help them. And this leads to working on a lot of different things. So clustering is a process that divides collections of objects into smaller groups that are to some degree similar to one another. I'm trying to avoid talking like a mathematician tonight. Um, so this lecture will look at clustering as a process, hopefully show you some clustering techniques you haven't seen before, and hopefully induce a certain useful skepticism. No, no. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to look at Kamian's clustering, because that's the simplest clustering algorithm I ever heard of, and it's good for illustrating everything else. <coughs> I'm going to look at dependence on initial conditions, which is a real problem with Kamian's. Then I'm going to look at hierarchical clustering, where we found a real horror story, sort of, you know, H.P. Lovecraft level. And um, the horror story is about sensitive dependence on addition and deletion of taxa. Then I'll stop for a minute. Then I want to talk about a solution to that problem, a clustering technique we thought of that manages to avoid problems caused by the way you choose to measure distance. Then I want to show you a fast, dirty clustering algorithm we invented very recently, and a visualization that only started running last Saturday. So, K-means clustering is a technique for breaking collections of data, points, defined by numerical values into K groups. Now you can stretch that. You can play with a lot and make it work on other types of data. The algorithm is iterative. It makes several passes for finding the clustering with each pass. So it's not that fast. Thousands of data items, easy peasy. Megadata, it can be a little slow unless you have lots of cores or something. Now one problem is that the user has to say how many clusters there are, and there are lots of patches for that. People will try a bunch of values at K, and they'll use a statistical desk or visualization to decide which is the most useful. Um, there's a lot of talk about finding needs that makes it sound a bit like a cross-country team. But... So the k-means algorithm is also stochastic. The series of iterations are initialized randomly, and so running the algorithm, again, can yield different clustering, and I'll have some examples of that happening in a sort of an annoying way. And then the behavior of k-means depends strongly on how you choose to measure the distance between points. How many choices do we have of different ways to measure distances between points? Hundreds. Uncountably infinitely many. <laughs> In practice, we only use a few thousand. But the choice matters, and a lot of people don't worry too much about that choice. I'm the math guy, so I worry about that choice, and funny things happen. So the basic algorithm is you tell it, you, you tell it the number of k, you give it some points, and it's supposed to tell you what clusters they're in. In this case, k equals 3. And then what you do is you pick three points to be the initial cluster centers. You assign points to the closest center. The new centers are the mean point positions of the clusters. And you keep doing that. Uh, then you reassign the points to the clusters. And you keep doing that until points do move, don't move, or until it's been going on too long. Because it's possible to construct these obnoxious examples where one point keeps jumping back and forth like an idiot. And then you report the clusters and or the cluster centers. And if the data are in nice, complex clusters, and that's a two-dimensional data set there that I intentionally generated to be perfect for k-means, it usually gives you the right answer. Now, it turns out when you do k-means clustering, there's a strong constraint on the shape of the cluster that can arise at all. So a shape is convex if any line between two point, line segment between two points in it stays inside the shape, otherwise it isn't. And there's an example of a convex and a non-convex shape. Every k-means clustering is an intersection of a partition of space into convex sets with the set of points being clustered. And so there what I did was I actually made a sort of a cobblestone tiling of assign a point to the cluster center it's closest to, but do it for every pixel in the image. And then for the things that are ambiguous, trim them black so they look like grout in between the tiles. And so for the blue dots are the cluster centers, the tiles are the regions where points would be grouped into clusters. So you take your data and you just intersect it with that. And that's the cluster things get assigned to. So are those cluster centers in the center of the regions they define? No, they're not. And that can cause a problem. Now, how on earth 
could you get something like these two guys? I mean, these cause a lot of trouble because the fact this one is right near that one means that this cluster hull for that one has the center way off at one side. How on earth can that happen with data? What about the data would do that? Oh, good. That's fine. I don't have the doohickey that makes the doohickey turn the doohickey on to do that. And I wonder a lot. Bunch of overlapping points on one side. Um, I'm a mathematician. Points can't overlap. They're zero dimensional. But what do you actually mean? Uh, repeated individual observations. Um, sort of maybe. Do you want to hear my answer? If the data does not have a very even distribution, there's a lot of data in one small area and almost nothing, and then a lot of data somewhere else. So when you have whole piles of data close together and then spaced out, sometimes k-means will split what should be a fairly tight cluster into two pieces. And that's what causes points that look like that. Now, that's the picture from before. And that's the picture where something went wrong. And it's the same algorithm. And it was run the same way. It picked three random points. The problem is this time, it picked three points all from that cluster by accident. And so one of the cluster centers got to here, and the other two split up that thing, and it drifted off, and the k-means actually got the clustering horribly wrong. Well, or less correct. Now, there's a reason I labeled that less correct rather than correct. And you know, this, it's easy to notice something went wrong. Simple compactness statistics will notice. And a lot the green points do belong together, and the cyan points do belong together. And of course, almost any serious k-means algorithm We'll do a little work to pick good centers before it starts. So a modern k-means algorithm will not do 99.999% of the things the original k-means algorithm might have done. It thinks a little about what its initial cluster centers are. OK, so k-means depend strongly on initial conditions. There is a horrible data set. I call it the, uh, the Tim Hortons data set, you know, the Tim bit and the donut. And so again, I ran the same algorithm over and over. And it always got the tin bit right, yeah? But it took the donut and broke it up every which way. And since the donut isn't a convex shape, it's never going to discover the donut as a single cluster. And in fact, it's going to arbitrarily break it into different convex shapes, pretty much with rotational symmetry about where the breaks could happen. And if I use more clusters, but stop just sort of breaking the tin bit in half, the donut would just get fragmented into more and more little itty bitty bits. OK, so let's stop for a minute and think about what else you could do with the k-means algorithm. It's just put everybody into clusters based on which center you're closest to, recompute the centers, and do that over and over, right? So the k-lines algorithm. Input a number k, points and in dimensions, output a point to line assignment. Details. Randomly assign points to groups. Fit lines to each group. Repeat. Assign points to the lowest error line and fit lines to the resulting groups until points don't move or too long. That's exactly the k-means algorithm, except I ripped out b closest to the center and replaced it with fit a least squares line. Now, I have here some contrived data to which this algorithm absolutely applies. What I did was I sampled points from three lines and added a small amount of Gaussian noise. And what happens is, is that this algorithm rediscovers which line each point came from, except for the ones near the intersection of the lines, which are a little ambiguous. But in fact, I could have ripped out B closest to the center and put in any sort of statistical structure, and the algorithm would still do something. There's a small chance it will do something interesting that you need in your work. But you have to think of what the statistical model is. Now, another thing I like to do, and this is a math thing, is I want to hand my algorithm a data set that is completely inappropriate and see what it did. So sampling points from a circle, yeah. lines do not statistically model the circle very well. You know, one, one's round and the other isn't. But it did pretty well. It found those lines to model the points sampled from the circle. So this is just to start you thinking about how the k-means algorithm, with little tweaks, can become a completely different algorithm. OK, now let's talk about hiring. Can anybody tell me what that is? Fern? Pardon? A fern? Hmm. It's a Lindenmeyer system, but sure. 
<laughs> okay, um, it's a model of plants, and uh, that's one of the spacer slides I put in, so I won't talk too fast. My, uh, my wife is here watching the show, and she's probably my best collaborator, but also she's the person that helped me learn not to give talks so fast that everybody cries or something. Okay, so a metric is a function, d of pq, from pairs of points to the real numbers that obeys the following rules. If pq and r are all points, then distances can't be negative. If the distance from a point to another point is zero, they have to be the same point. The distance from a to b has to be the distance from b to a. And if you go around two sides of a triangle, you went at least as far as going around the third side of the triangle. These are the rules that make something a distance measure, at least from the point of view of mathematicians. I know that biologists often relax one of these axioms because they need a distance measure. The most common one to relax is the second one. You're perfectly happy to have things that are different be a distance zero from one another because they're pretty similar. And the other one that sometimes goes wrong is the triangle inequality because, you know, biology can happen in a hyperbolic data space. And so Euclidean distance is the standard distance we use in space. Just the, you, you take the coordinate differences, you square them, you add them up, you take the square root. Manhattan distance is um, called that because it's the distance you would use if you were on Manhattan Island. Because on Manhattan Island, the shortest distance between two points contains a building. And so you have to, you know, go along the x and y axes, or whatever they are, oriented. And then one that comes up a lot in biology is the Edit or Levenstein distances, distance which is sort of the minimum number of small changes you could make to turn one string into another. And um, it's colossally annoying. There's a, there's a field of math called coding theory. And it's mostly used in communications, and it's used for correcting errors in binary channels. And we needed an error correcting code in DNA to make labels for bioconstructs that after sequencing could be recovered, even if there were a few sequencing errors. And so Jess Campbell, who was one of my doctoral students, did a 250-page doctoral thesis in mathematics that she defended successfully that reproduced the first 10 pages of standard error correcting code theory for the Hamming metric. I, I hate the edit distance. It's too hard. Anyway, I'm going to construct a metric in a minute. So here, in case you forgot, is one type of hierarchical clustering, neighbor joining. What you do is you find the two closest points and you join them and replace them with their center of mass. And you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. And when you're done, they're all joined. And you take the last join and hold it up and shake the thing out, and you get a tree. And that tree is a clustering in the sense that things that are close to one another in the tree are sort of in the same cluster. But unlike the k-means clustering, the cluster has hierarchical structure, so you can tell degrees of relatedness. OK. So when you do that, you're going to get a distance matrix for your points. Usually not a big problem unless they're more, you know, unless you have a lot of points, and it can be really problematic if the distance is expensive. People spend a lot of time learning to compute edit distance faster because it's useful, but it's a little bit slow. So neighbor joining requires a single pass of the data. Join, 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 done. And like the barcode of life software for the, um, these, they're across the street from me in Guelph, and they're trying to uh, get the cytochrome oxidase subunit C gene for every animal on Earth. And um, these things are highly diagnostic of species. Anyway, so they do this on the fly to preside visualizations of groups of taxes selected by researchers who, yeah, I want these 3,000 barcodes, show me the tree. <laughs> Here it is. Now, click. Pre-clustering data can help you speed up neighbor joining a lot. If you're building a tree and you already know that the fish are a tree and the birds are a tree, you don't ever compare fish to birds, and you save a lot of time. And there's a problem. This is the actual point I have with stability against adding or deleting single taxa. So the first thing I want to do is turn the tree into something more mathematical. So here we have, I think, the correct relatedness for humans, bats, rats, and possums. And I'm going to turn them into sets by just saying that any node in the tree is the set of the leaves below it. No problem, that's easy. The top is human, bat, rat, possum, and below it is human, bat, rat, and possum, and then human, bat, rat splits into rat and human, bat, and then there's human and bat. Now suppose you have a set S of taxa, in this case those four. Then if T is a collection of subsets of S, so that the whole set is in there, every individual thing is in there, and for any two things in there, either one is a subset of the other, or they have nothing in common, then they form a tree. In fact, any set of sets like that forms a phylogenetic tree. And this lets me turn it into something that's really easy to manipulate with a computer. So in fact, um, we thought this up as an example for my second year set theory course. And then it turned out that they couldn't quite follow it, but it was useful for biology. So 
The mineral containing clay, if you tax it in a tree, is the set of all taxa descended from their most recent common ancestor. The mineral containing clay of A and B in the tree on the left is AB, but on the right it's ABCD. And so the size of the mineral containing clay is a very simple measure of how closely related two things are. The mineral containing clay vector of a tree is a vector indexed by all the pairs of taxa and containing the size of the mineral containing clay. So you just compute all of them. This is a theorem that Colin Lee, one of my students, did. The map from trees to their mineral containing clay vector is an injection. That's too mathy. So two trees are different if and only if their mineral containing clay vectors are different. And the nice thing about, well, the first thing that's nice about this is the minimal containing clay vector completely ignores if you were to like put A, B here and C there. When you draw a tree, you have all these choices about which way the branching goes. The minimal containing clay vector washes that out. You just get a vector indexed by the pairs of taxa. So you have to put them in a consistent order. But the other thing that's really cool is it injects the trees into Euclidean space. So, we take trees to minimal containing clay vectors, and then once we have them turned into these vectors of numbers, any method of computing distances on vectors of numbers computes distances between trees. So it induces a distance measure on trees. And the normal Euclidean metric, the one we're all used to, works fine. The size of a mineral containing clay is a good measure of how closely related two taxa are, and so the MCC induced distances are often good measures of how different two trees on the same set of taxa are. If you get a large distance, it's because they disagree about the relatedness of a lot of pairs of things down at the bottom of the tree. Okay, so. Since I teach too many first year math classes, let's do an example. There's those two different trees. I went through and like AB it's two and four, and like BC it's three and four. So BC, three and four. So I'm computing the minimal containing clades. I then take the difference and take the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences, and so those two trees are the square root of 10 apart. I really can compute distances between trees. Now the units of this distance still mystify me. And in fact, this got pretty bad because um, I had somebody who just finished a master's degree on coming up with a better clustering technique, and, part, and she was using this stuff. And so she came to me and said, what's the farthest apart two trees on Antarctica can be? And I said, oh, it's, it's, wow, that's a good question. And I still don't know. It turns out to be really hard to compute the maximum, though I know something close to the maximum by just generating lots of random trees and checking the distance between them. This is a bad habit I picked up from working with biologists. When you can't do math, just simulate. <laughs> OK, so there are two ways to remove a taxa from a neighbor joining tree. Well, there's a lot more, but there are two I like. Either it can be snipped out. I don't like C. Snip. There's the new tree. And I'm going to call that T sub C. Or the taxa can be removed from the, from the data set, and you run the algorithm again to rebuild the tree. And then I'm going to call that T super C. Neighbor joining is known to sometimes be unstable with respect to addition or deletion of taxa. So there's a very natural stability measure. For every single taxa, compute the distance between the SNP and the rebuild, or the, yeah, the rebuild and the SNP tree, and then divide by the number of taxa. So you get the average change in the tree resulting from deleting each of the taxa one after the other. And so my plan, Colin had thought up this cool distance measure. So my plan was to generate a whole bunch of random data sets and check their stability and have Colin use his great skill with theorem and proof techniques to figure out what the rare unstable data sets were like and why they were unstable. Does that sound like a plan? This is an example of no plan survives contact with the enemy. <laughs> so if you got a score of zero for this thing, that would mean the tree was completely stable. And zero is here. So I generated 40,000 random data sets, and the maximum instability I got was around 120. And I now that know that for those data sets, the maximum possible is close to 140. But there's an upper tail that isn't shown. But what happened is almost every data set was phenomenally unstable. The tree rearranged itself like crazy for at least some of the taxa. So there are taxa you can remove that don't have much effect. But there's almost always one taxa you can remove that will blow up your tree. How many people think that's sad? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I gave this lecture to my um, graduate bioinformatical statistics um, class, or this part of it, last week. 
And I was talking about HPLUS, which uses the algorithm I used to generate this data set. And he said in sort of a shocked voice, I use HPLUS. <laughs> OK. So. so the stability issues are not as great when the data points arise from a process based on common descent. You remember how I said that k-means work really well if you have really good clusters? Well, the neighbor training algorithm is going to rediscover the true tree if the data was based on a tree cleanly. And so a common descent process like evolution tends to generate data sets on which neighbor joining works well. So that's kind of, you know, a little bit good. The stability measure developed for this demonstration can be used to check the stability and so probably the appropriateness of a data set as a target for hierarchical clustering. It will work on any data set and any hierarchical clustering algorithm. So if you had a lot of processors to burn, you could actually check the stability of the algorithm you've chosen on the data set you want to work on. You can keep checking algorithms until you find one that's stable. Now, why do we care about stability? Well, this tree is giving you a hypothesis about who's related to who. If the tree is unstable, your hypothesis is correct only by accident. OK. The scale problem can be generated, solved by generating random data and doing simulation. Never mind, I already sort of said that. And neighbor joining is only one of many ways of doing hierarchical clustering. In fact, Mandy's whole thesis was coming up with a more stable one. And I would be talking about it tonight, except that she's almost got the R tool finished and asked me to wait until she can release it. So we're trying to get this out. The other thing is, the neighbor joining algorithm given earlier joined clusters based on their average position, which is a popular method. The default for R's age class function is to use the largest distance between a point in this cluster and a point in that cluster as the distance between clusters. This is the conservative choice. But in fact, there's a lot of different ways that you could measure distances between clusters, and each of them gives different results. Yay. Let's stop for a minute and see if there's a question. Yeah? So usually we assess the stability of trees with um, bootstrap. Yeah, that gives a different answer from my method. My method is much less optimistic than bootstrapping. So, so why, why do you do that? Like, so which I think why? bootstrapping is an inappropriate method. I think it was a method that somebody had heard of and tried, and it gave a fairly good signal. But there's no proof that bootstrapping is a good method. There's no careful examination that bootstrapping is a good method. It's just in wide use, just like hierarchical clustering. Remember, I'm a mathematician and a professional paranoid because of that. So don't take what I say too seriously. We're 50 years behind the physicists cleaning up their mess in mathematical physics, and that's the cleanest of the scientific disciplines. You guys produce impossible stuff from a perspective of proving stability. Anyway, yeah? Just to follow up on that, from a biologist's perspective, right? You know, there is considerable empirical support that bootstrapping can, in many instances, perform well. So it's certainly true that there's no, you know, clear, perhaps, mathematical formalism of a reduction to theory outside of statistical framework. But how do you think you could compare methods like this directly to bootstrapping in order to convince, say, recalcitrant biologists that they should switch to your method? I'll create a data set through a synthetic common descent process in which I know the true tree, and I have control over the amount of noise in the process and the resolution of the samples over evolutionary time, and test it. But remember, what I said wasn't neighbor joining is bad. What I said is, I've found classes of data on which neighbor joining is horrible, and ones on which it works OK. And by the way, here's a method for checking stability in general. Yeah, bootstrapping is another such method. And in two years, I may be able to come back and tell you what I think of bootstrapping, but I haven't really tested it yet. Yeah? So usually when we make phylogenetic trees, you use something more advanced, like, uh, like a Bayesian tree or a maximum likelihood, or uh, like a different method you use? Actually, most use. people make phylogenetic trees with h cluster because almost all the phylogenetic trees made in the world are made by the Barcode Institute for people who are logged into its website. Yes, you're right. A serious scientist would use a much more advanced and stable algorithm. But nobody even asks what algorithm is being used when they run a piece of software, unless they're like the people in this room and actually know the alternatives. Yeah. No, there are much better, there are much better methods. It's just I wanted to understand I wanted to understand this simple algorithm and I found it blew up in my face. Now we've got good alternatives to it. There are other good alternatives to it. And in fact, 
The reason I like Mandy's stuff better than maximum likelihood trees is I think it's producing similar quality, but we need to document that, but it's also enormously faster. Remember that? That was where we were breaking the donut up into pieces in a sad way. Okay. This also speaks to my question about not being sure of the level of the audience. You guys are about two levels above what I wrote the talk for, for which I apologize. Okay, so, look, it's been clustered correctly, even though it has a funny non-convex shape. So, pick a range of values of k. Initialize a giant matrix on all the data points, which is problematic, though you can store it as a sparse matrix and maybe not get in too much trouble. Repeat many times, pick k from your range, do k means clustering, and for all pairs that are in a cluster together, add one to the matrix at that point. So what I'm going to do is every time two things are in a cluster together, I'm going to strengthen the association between them. And after I've done it a lot of times, I'll have this great big association matrix. Then I'm done. I remove weak edges. I haven't told you what weak means. And the connected components are the clusters. So what happens is this is connected to that, 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 all the way around. None of those are connected to any of those. But I'm looking at the transitive closure, viewing this thing as a combinatorial graph. And it actually gets non-convex objects correct. So this is really slow. I was complaining that k-means was a little slow. And this one needs to run k-means hundreds to hundreds of thousands of times, depending on how big the data set is. So it's ridiculously slow. The other thing is you need a range of values for k. And it also needs to be larger than the number. The smallest k you could choose needs to be larger than the number of clusters you expect. Having multiple values of k reduces the chance of detecting idiosyncratic features of the data. And I'll actually show you one of those in a minute. If we normalize by the number of clusterings, the connections are in the range 0 to 1. And we have a theorem that says that if you do this a lot, you're not doing something stochastic. You're stochastically approximating a fixed object. There's an actual final associator matrix that has specific values. And in very simple cases, you can compute it by linear algebra instead of running the computer a lot. Um, and how many times your k-means cluster and your range of k's are tunable parameters? So those each turn out to approximate a different fixed associator matrix, unless you think this is going too well. And so there's one k-means clustering of this data set. And there it is correctly clustered into three clusters. So we cut plot. When we finish building the matrix M using multi-clustering, it contains information about how strongly connected each pair of points is. This can be used, oh, and if it's a very large data set, you're dead unless most of those are zeros that you're not storing. So you really need to be good with sparse methods to make this work. We can think of M as specifying a network on the data points with a strength value for that connection. To get clusters, we pick a connection strength and delete all the connections that are not at least that strong. So I'm getting toward a definition of weak. The number of clusters is the number of resulting connected networks. The cluster derived in this fashion has its own remaining network structure that you can also look at. And finally, a cut plot is a graph of the number of clusters you would get as a function of the strength you chose to cut at. So don't cut, probably everything connected. Cut here, suddenly it falls into two clusters, and so on. And the nice thing about the cut plot is it actually gives you advice about how many clusters there are. The, ring, the ball ring ring data set, I think there are three clusters. And this is the result I got. Cutting anywhere between about 0.24 and about 0.57, I get three clusters. So the plot says there's a lot of support for there being three clusters. This, not surprisingly, breaks it into the outer ring and the inner ring in the ball. This one I'll show you. It's an example of an idiosyncratic feature of the data. So. That's the two-cluster solution. That's the four-cluster solution. And look, that part of the outer ring really wasn't connected all that tightly, so it fell off. And if you only use one value for k, your chance of detecting something like that early goes way up. That's why you want to use several different values of k for your k-means cluster. OK, so there are some other things that had no trouble clustering. <coughs> And the clusterings and k-means clustering are the transitive closure of associations resulting from many applications of the basic k-means algorithm. While basic k-means produces convex clusters, multi-clustering washes out those restrictions by amalgamating the results of lots of them, and it just con discovers connected shapes. Now, these are ideal, because the points are really close together, so the transitive closure is very clean. You do this on real data, it will be less clean. In addition, 
The basic data object places an edge-weighted graph structure or network structure on the data, which can be mined for additional information, and it can also be turned into a fairly good distance measure, though you have to tinker with it a little, for the objects in the clusters. So, um, let's skip this. So the role of the k-means algorithm is to create associations between data elements. The association matrix is a framework for assembling the information from different applications of k-means, but in fact, as long as you normalize so that one method wasn't producing more numbers than the bigger numbers than the other, you could also use this to glue together lots of different clustering methods. It's an amalgamation technique. You just use them all to, act, to strengthen the connections in the matrix. So any reasonable similarity measure can be used to generate associations, and that's Mandy's thesis. She used a very different one. Then the edge-weighted network encoded into the associator matrix can be used to build taxonomic trees of the data. And doing that has enormously better stability than H plus style whole neighbor joint. It probably is similar to um, Bayesian trees or maximum likelihood methods. I think it's faster. We're still doing the testing. Multi-clustering different from ensemble clustering in a specific way? It's a type of ensemble clustering. Okay. So multi-clustering is strictly for k-means? No, I just said it. While I developed it for k-means, you could actually use it to amalgamate any sort of clustering methods. So it's a version of ensemble clustering, just a specific sort that I discovered on my own and I'm using to illustrate this. I'm also no longer using it because I found something cooler, but <laughs> <laughs> Can you give yeah. examples of data uh, um, where you would use multi-clustering? Um, there's one paper published on it by a collaborator of mine in Korea that shows it works really well for microarray data. It also works really well on abstract mathematical data that the name wouldn't make sense to you. <laughs> but I normally work with collaborators. And like I said, he's probably right about there being other clustering methods that will work fine. I'm working on the speed problem, and I'm not done yet. Okay. Speaking of the microarray data, so far that we've seen complex groupings on two-dimensional space, but so it works well in high-dimensional space too, or is there It has worked well in at least one high-dimensional space so far. Okay, is there, is, are you gonna mention anything about the, the trade-offs in the high-dimensional space between the different approaches in this? Or is that coming up? If not, then can you can you say anything just generally about that? I think it might be coming up, but let's save that one for the end. Okay. I'm surprised nobody asked me what the what the spacer picture is. Okay, so um nope. Let's skip ahead. Okay, so really fast, low quality clustering. That's 32 points, and it's spaced out very evenly in a square. It's possible to create such a race of points for any of any reasonable size in almost any data space that can be specified to a computer, square, rectangle, surface, circle, surface of a sphere. But how do you use a cloud of points that are well spaced out in a space like that for clustering? And what you do is you treat them just like the centers in k-means. You bin points according to which of them they're closest to. It's a single pass through the algorithm through the data space, so it's a linear time clustering method, which is kind of nice. But the only reason it's a clustering method at all is the degree to which you carefully space those points out so they're really evenly spaced through your data space. And those, those um, point clouds are really expensive to produce. But there's the point cloud. I just rotated it and flipped it over in all the eight ways you can rotate and flip a square. Each of those would interact with the data in a different way and produce a different clustering. Now, a square can only be done in eight ways, but for instance, if we had a six-dimensional hypercube, there would be 46,080 orientations of each such point cloud. The number is actually the dimension factorial times two to the power of the dimension. So for high-dimensional data, this thing you can recluster a lot really fast, and then you could use an ensemble method to glue those together if you wanted a really good clustering. This is Mandy's PhD thesis and the code mostly exists and is being tested. Okay, so the technique is really fast, but since the clusters are specified in a sense before seeing the data, they don't adapt to the data at all. So there'll be low quality clusterings unless we get lucky. We can do point cloud binning, ignore small clusters, and then use surviving point cloud members to initialize another technique, like k-means. That's an example of a way to give k-means really good centers. 
and it makes k-means converge much faster. Using a point cloud in multiple orientations to do many clusterings can be the basis of a multi-clustering. That sort of multi-clustering would be a lot less slow. But here's the technique I really like that we came up with about six months ago. You don't put the points in the data space. If you have a lot of data, you use choose a random point from your data set as the random point generator that underlies the packing process, and you pack from your data. The advantage, you remember earlier I said, how those two centers get so close together? The data's clumpy? Well, one of the things this point cloud method does is we cluster it. The variance of the cluster sizes is an objective measure of how screwed up your data is in terms of clumpiness. It gives us a hyperdimensional measure of the, the, the density variation in the data. And in fact, I can go one step further with that. I think that's really useful, but like I said, we figured it out very recently. And so, for example, we took um, the which codons are used by each gene for the entire human genome. We used to point, we then pulled points from the human genome codon usage records using my algorithm, but with choose a random data point as the initialization technique. And it turns out we really needed to do that because this data is unbelievably clumpy. And when we did that, what we got was the clusters we got by point packing had very, very significant go term over representation. So we were finding something real, at least some of the time. And that's just a page from the paper Matt is supposed to get back to me tomorrow, so we can submit it on time. And um, you know, the, 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 we got ridiculous uh, p values. Now, Matt forgot to do the multiple testing correction, but his p values are like. 10 to the negative eighth, so that's going to ruin them all the way back up to 10 to the negative fifth, and so I'm not sad. That was one of the corrections I gave him. And now, that's a, that's a graph. Um, so, graph. you guys already know what graphs are? Dots connected by lines? Okay, so no problem. So what I'm going to do is this. I have a clustering of a data set, wherever I got it from, and I can measure the distance between clusters somehow. Then I'm going to decide, I'm going to define a graph where the vertices are just the clusters, and you have an edge by closing an edge between a vertex and its three nearest neighbors. Now, I pulled the number three out of my hat. I've used two and four, they both work fine, and you'll probably want to tune it to your data set. Since a vertex may be one of the three nearest neighbors of a vertex that is not one of its three nearest neighbors, you're going to get at least three neighbors for each vertex. That means the vertices at either end of an edge would be fairly near a data space. So you get something like that. That's one I made up. I have a real one as my last real slide. And I'm going to, yeah, I'll finish on time. So look at that. What do you see? Well, there's probably really one big cluster right in there somewhere. And this is a pretty sparse part of the space. And this is probably another really big cluster unless they're little outliers. So this diagram gives me a sense of how clumpy the data is. But since I turned it into a combinatorial graph, and just use some algorithm to lay it out, it's always a two-dimensional picture, no matter how high-dimensional the data is. Now, oh, sorry, I didn't revise that slide. Let's go back to this one. So um, there's perfectly good public domain code. GraphViz does graph layout. You can cluster several times to get multiple pictures of the same data, which will give you better perspective. And if you change the number of clusters, you get structural information about them. If you tag particular data points, you can watch which clusters broke into which other clusters. And this, this started running literally last weekend because I was giving this talk. I've had the idea for about a month. And um, let's look at the real one. So that's, um, I'm trying to teach my bioinformatics students how to deal with what will happen to them when they start working in biology labs. Somebody will come in with some data, and they'll know something about how they acquired it, but they won't know much about its structure. So I just gave them five data sets I made up, and I'm asking them to figure out their structure. And this is the first one. And look, it's donut-shaped. And I know it's donut-shaped because I know how I generate it, but I was really happy to see an obvious donut shape. Also. There are, the labels are the number of points in each cluster, so there's a lot of points there and there, and this is pretty sparse, and then there's a whole lot of points here and here. So there's a couple of dense regions on opposite sides of the donut. And if you just keep changing the number of clusters, you get more and more pictures until you start building up in your mind sort of a sense of what the data looks like. 
This also gives me a really good sense that this data is exceedingly clunky. I'm done.